So UFC 300 just took place and it was a fantastic card. I've already made a video going over and recapping the entire card, but I probably will do a little bit of that in this video. But in this video, I've matched up every single fighter on the card with who I think they should fight next in their next fight. And that includes the winners and the losers of every fight on this card because every fight on this card was a pretty big deal so I feel like it is going to be a little bit interesting to potentially look into the future and see what the future holds for every fighter that happens to fight on this card. It starts with the main event Alex Pereira got a very impressive win against Jamal Hill. He didn't take any damage whatsoever but he did say that he's interested into a move up to heavyweight which I think is a little bit of an odd kind of call out to make and he did double down on that in the post fight press conference when he sat down with the reporters. He doesn't seem that keen on the plan of winning at UFC 300 and then winning at UFC 301. He actually seems a little bit more interested in that heavyweight move but honestly if Pereira was to fight next I feel like the pretty obvious result or not pretty obvious next opponent would be Magomed Ankalaev. He probably is the most deserving title contender right now. But if the UFC really wanted to push something for 301, I think that they could just go in the direction of saying, oh, hey, who's ready to fight Pereira at 301? Is it Ankalaev? Is it Nikita Krylov? Is it Khalil Roundtree? I mean, you know, there's a lot of kind of options they could potentially go. I do think, or is it Yuri? Can Yuri fight at 301 in a rematch? Or they're just going to go the Tom Espinall route. Tom Espinall seems interested in the idea he posted on Instagram, but he did recently talk with, I believe it was Ariel Hawani, and he said that he wants to fight Curtis Blade, but by the sounds of it, that's not a done deal. So are the UFC just going to push Alex Pereira to potentially win a third title in a different weight class against Tom Espinall, or are they going to do Espinall versus Blade? Or... Are they going to do Pereira versus Magomed and Kalaev? I feel like the Ankalaev fight is the fight that probably makes the most sense. That's probably the smartest matchup to make. But if Pereira is being serious about fighting at 301, maybe Yuri versus Pereira is the fight to make. But Yuri did take a lot of damage in that fight. And he's actually the fighter that I've got for Jamal Hill. Because in that post-fight press conference, Alex Pereira was actually quite dismissive of rematching Yuri Prohaska. Alex Pereira said that he wants to take on the biggest challenges, he wants to take on fighters that he thinks can pose a challenge for him, and he just said that he's already beaten Yuri before, and he doesn't want to fight Yuri again until he wins another fight, so I feel like that's what you do, I mean Yuri took a lot of damage against Rakic, he's not really a fighter that is known for his activity, so if you're not going to do Yuri versus Alex Pereira next, I feel like you do Yuri versus Jamal Hill next, because of course, Yuri and Jamal Hill were both champions at one point that both vacated the belt, so there's not any history there, but they are former champions, and it would be a good fight because they are both strikers, so I think you go down the route of matching up Jamal Hill, who was just knocked out by Alex Pereira, with Yuri Prohaska in quite a few months' time. I mean, it depends if Yuri wants to be active, but as I said, I know he was injured, he isn't necessarily a fighter in general known for his activity. You know, he did take a year off between Reyes and Shira. That was a shoulder injury though, wasn't it? Was that between Clover and Alex? Oh man, I'm lost. The point is though, Yuri in general doesn't fight that often. I think Jamal Hill needs to take some time off. He just got injured. Oh, he didn't get injured. He just got knocked out by Alex Pereira. And he was recovering from an injury before that anyway. So Hill versus Yuri is the matchup I've made there. Weili Zhang just beat Yan Zhaonang. There is absolutely nobody else in the division for her to fight that she hasn't already fought next or a matchup that just makes sense. Other than Tatiana Suarez, who is 10-0 and recently made her big return. You know, she was at uh, number one of the top ranked fighters in 2019, got injured really badly multiple times. His comeback has looked really good against Montana De La Rosa, has looked really good against Jessica Andrade. She's 33 years old. I feel like the time is now for Suarez, then the opportunity is there, I feel like there's not really a better matchup to be made for Zhang right now, aside from a matchup with Tatiana Suarez, so I think that's what you do, unless Rose Nami Yunus wants to come back down to 115 pounds and you just give her a title shot because she's the only one to defeat Zhang in the UFC, I think Suarez versus Zhang is the fight to make, and then as for Yan Xiaonan, she put up a really good fight against Wei Li Zhang. And I think that she should fight another fighter that's going to want to strike with her because I think that's going to be a very fun matchup. So Amanda Limoges 
versus Yan Xiaonan. I think Limoche might be injured. I mean, she... No, it was Tatiana Suarez that pulled out of the matchup again. Okay, that's interesting. And Duran fought Limoche on short notice. How did I not know that before recording the video? I'm an idiot at the end of the day. I think Amanda Limoche versus Yan Xiaonan's the matchup to make. It makes sense rankings-wise. They both lost to Zhang Limoche in a much more dominant fashion than Yan. But I think that Yan versus Limoche is a very sellable matchup at women's 115 pounds and would be an absolute banger that you can add to the prelims of any pay-per-view. Max Holloway just knocked out Justin Gaethje. Some could say that he's earned an opportunity to fight for the lightweight title and he actually called out Islam Akachev and he actually said that Islam Akachev seems to like to defend his title against featherweight so why not defend against me? Well, he's already got his fight booked against Dustin Poirier and that kind of leaves Max Holloway with no real clear opponent at 155, unless he did want to kind of go down a route of maybe fighting Sarukin or Oliveira. But if I was Holloway, I wouldn't do that. And I would just kind of bank on what I've already done at 145 pounds and go back down to 145 pounds and fight Ilya Tapuria. And one thing about Ilya Tapuria is he didn't look like he reacted super well to Max Holloway's knockout over Justin Gaethje. And to put it out there right now, I think that Ilya Tapuria would give Max Holloway a very difficult match. So, I think Max Holloway would give Ilya Tapuria a very difficult fight. And I think he's a pretty good style to potentially beat Ilya Tapuria. Man, that would be a good fight though. I think that's what you do. I think you've got to do Tapuria versus Holloway. That's the fight to make. A lot of people are talking about Evloev versus Holloway. or Sorry, Evloev versus Tapuria. Put that in the bin. Holloway versus Tapuria. I don't think you can get much more hyped up than that. Justin Gaethje's next opponent was really hard to pick out because he's kind of already fought anyone that makes sense. You know, he's beaten Poirier. He's beaten Fiziev. He's fought Oliveira, and I guess you could do that rematch, but I feel like he's going to take a lot of time off now because he was just knocked out by Max Holloway and quite badly. Chandler's going to be fighting McGregor now, which was a rematch I was kind of thinking about because it would be fun. There's no real obvious matchup at all for Gaethje to do, but especially when you consider the fact he's going to have to take time off. You could maybe do Gaethje versus Volkanovski, but Volkanovski seems to want to come back soon and maybe not even at 155. Who knows? I've gone with Benil Dariush. I mean, he's just not fought Dariush before. It's not a big name, but... It just is what it is. I I really struggle to find an opponent for Gaethje that just makes sense at the moment, to be honest, because I do think he's going to take a lot of time away. And then Armin Sarukian defeated Charles Oliveira. I have had my opinion on this fight known. I do believe, I do think that Oliveira should have got the nod. I thought he won rounds one and three because he was the closest to finishing the fight. It is what it is. It is what it is. Armin Sarukin got the decision. And one thing I'm going to say about Armin, he got robbed of a fight against Makachev because Makachev is now booked to take on Dustin Poirier. Dustin Poirier is on a one-fight win streak over, Benil, uh, over, sorry, over Benoit Saint-Denis, who was ranked number 11 or something like that. You know, like it just doesn't make sense at all. So Makachev's getting his legacy padded and he's not going to be fighting what would be a very tough stylistic matchup in Armin Sarukian. So I feel like Armin Sarukian, he is pretty young, so I think he's going to have to go on ice and fight Makachev in Dubai in like November or something like that. So Islam Makachev versus Armin Sarukian in Dubai. I think it's been confirmed for November. So let's do that. Or maybe it's October, something like that. Charles Oliveira... I thought he should have won the decision, but unfortunately for Charlie Olives, he didn't get it done. And honestly, Charlie Olives kind of has a lot of options open because he's a big guy. I wouldn't hate the idea of just seeing Charles put on a bunch of mass and fighting at 170 pounds, but a man did call him out, and that man was Mateus Gamrot. Charles Oliveira's got a kid on the way. That could mean that he's going to take a very significant amount of time off, and if he is going to do that, then maybe he could bulk up to 170. Who knows? But if he wants to fight soon, he could fight Mateus Gamrot on the on the uh, Conor McGregor card in, in June, which is only like 10 weeks away. I believe it might be July. But anyway, Gamrot versus Oliveira. That's a fight I'd put on the main card of the Conor McGregor fight. I think that Oliveira beats Gamrot. I think he beats him relatively easily. Gamrot is not a good striker at all, but he excels in the wrestling. I think Oliveira would beat Gamrot, and I think that is a smart matchup. It was a good call-up from Gamrot, took advantage of an opportunity... Good work for Gamrot. 
nobody really cared about Bonacool versus Bronage. Even the even the people in the crowd didn't even know who they were, which was kind of interesting. So um, why do I have Nikita Krylov? Oh, that's right, Nikita Krylov is injured at the moment. But um, I'll talk about that in a second. Wait, Krylov's in the wrong order. That's my opponent for Rakic. This is this video is a mess. Um, <laughs> Bonacool beat Brundage is the point, and I think you should fight Brad Tavares next. The main reason being, Brad Tavares is a veteran of the UFC. He's a respectable name. If you beat Brad Tavares, you're a pretty big deal. He doesn't really get finished that much. I know he's been KO'd five times, which is a bad look, but he's been in there with some tough guys. I mean, Drikas 2 plus C couldn't finish him. He's now the champion. By the way, Arasanya couldn't finish him. He's one of the greatest middleweights of all time. He recently beat Weidman. He lost to Rodriguez. If Bonacle goes out there against Brad Tavares, I do think that's a respectable opponent for Nicol, even though it's a good stylistic matchup for him. And if he finishes Tavares, it's going to be a pretty big deal. So that's what I've gone with there. And I went with Oban Elliott as the next opponent for Cody Brundage. Cody Brundage did the UFC a favor. I... Don't think a lot of people would see this as the UFC doing Cody Brundage a favor, but I do believe that Oban Elliott is stylistically a good matchup for Brundage, and especially a good matchup for Brundage to show off how good his striking is, because Brundage has been talking about how he's been working on his boxing for ages, and we've never really seen it, like, at all, because he's been pulling guillotine and he's doing silly things. Against Bronicle, he didn't even really box that much, he was just throwing spinning kicks and spinning back fists, which is... I guess it was fun, it didn't really work, but let's see how good that boxing really is against another wrestler, by the way, in Open Elliot, and a wrestler which I do believe that Cody Brunish would be able to nullify, so you could either do this in the Apex, or you could do it on the early prelims of a card in Manchester, which the UFC is planning on doing. I do know that Wales is not England, which a lot of people will probably comment, I understand that, but... It looks like Oban Elliott was actually born in England. So look at that. <laughs> Somewhat of a home fight for Oban Elliott. Brunage for Bonacool at UFC 300 on the main card. I feel like Brunage is not going to be scared on flying overseas and fighting someone else in their home sort of territory. So give me Brunage versus Oban Elliott. I think it just makes sense. Yuri, I matched up with Jamal Hill. And Nikita Krylov, I had in the wrong order. Alexander Rakic got knocked out by Yuri and he took a lot of damage in that fight as well. I mean, it was a pretty... It wasn't a bad stoppage, but it was a it was a stoppage in which Rakic took a lot of damage and accumulation. I think he's going to need to take a lot of time off, and Nikita Krylov is one of those guys who, he lives in the middle of nowhere. I don't actually know where he lives. I think he lives in the middle of nowhere in Russia at the moment, but he doesn't post much on social media, so it's actually hard to tell if Nikita Krylov is, 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 is still even just around, <laughs> you know? But he is, he is. The last that I heard about Nikita Krylov is that he had to have surgery on an injury. So he's recovering from an injury right now. He's recovering from a surgery. So Krylov's going to be out for a few months, potentially. And you know who else is going to be out for a few months? And they haven't fought before either. Alexander Rakic. And that's a banger fight, dude. Like, that's an Apex main event all day i mean it's gonna be so fun it's a pay-per-view main card opener Rakic and krylov i think they would bring it krylov is one of my favorite fighters by the way i am a big fan how did he miss weight by that much oh catch weight okay 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 point is i'm the massive fan of krylov i think he's a very fun fighter man i'm a big believer in krylov as well i think that this guy does potentially have championship material but the one guy that really would potentially test that is a man in alexander Rakic. so let's do it that's a fight that makes sense I'll see you guys with the next of the prelims as I'm going to record them in two separate videos so I don't have 50,000 tabs open on Google. So the next fight down is Aljamain Sterling versus Calvin Qatar, and in that matchup, Aljamain Sterling just absolutely dominated Calvin with his wrestling. And he actually made a call out, I don't think this was on the mic, this was in the post-event press conference, I think he called out Brian Ortega. And I think that's a matchup that makes sense. Now, I did see people commenting on this matchup as a potential bleed being made, as a lot of people were saying, too soon for Aljamain Sterling. And I'm kind of thinking to myself, like, what do you mean too soon for Aljamain Sterling? Aljamain Sterling is the former bantamweight champion that defended his titles many times. And to be fair, some of it controversial, but he still defended the belt at 135 multiple times. You're not rushing him. He's already fought at the top level in one of the best uh, best weight classes in the division at 135 pounds. 
So let's give him the number three ranked guy, Brian Ortega. And honestly, you could make this a title eliminator. I don't think you can give Brian Ortega a title shot off a win over Yaya Rodriguez in that rematch there. So Ortega versus uh, Aljamain Sterling, I think you could sell as a title eliminator because you do have the former bantamweight champion in Aljo and then a former title challenger in Ortega who took some time off, a lot of time off, and then just beat Yaya Rodriguez. The winner of that fight, I think, could definitely then fight the champion or maybe maybe a number one contender if it is Aljamain Sterling or maybe Ortega just whoever wins and whatever the situation is at 145 pounds depends how active the champion wants to be for Calvin Qatar I was actually thinking about Bryce Mitchell but then I was like oh I think the UFC would do it because it would be another wrestler that Qatar would have to deal with and he did not deal very well at all with Sterling's wrestling but I was thinking if the UFC wanted to do something fun, then I think they would actually just call up Dan Ige. And I know this is a rematch from the fight that did happen in a main event, I believe, that happened. It was five rounds in 2020, and in that matchup, Calvin Qatar did beat Dan Ige. But I think you can sell a rematch, you know what I mean? It would be, what, like four years apart since the first fight happened, and I feel like at this point now, Dan Ige is kind of in a situation which you'd give to Calvin Qatar because he is coming off that loss to Arnold Allen, and then, in my opinion, a pretty bad loss to Aljamain Sterling. So give him someone else that's in the rankings, but someone who's way lower in the rankings. And let's just see what happens. Honestly, I think it is a potential matchup that Dan Ige could maybe win, maybe not, but... It's a, it's a matchup that I think does make sense considering there are a lot of people booked at £145 right now. Kayla Harrison, I know that there is the Amanda Nunes situation, which I think probably deserves its own video, but I think the most likely thing, and what I would do, is um, Amanda Nunes, you retired. Kayla Harrison versus the champion. And that's right, a lot of people don't know this. Raquel Pennington is the champion of Bantamweight right now. Not for long. Not for long. Hopefully she doesn't pull a Nico Montano, because I'm telling you right now, what just happened to Holly Holm, I genuinely believe Kayla Harrison would be able to replicate against Raquel Pennington, and I do believe that Kayla Harrison, a healthy Kayla Harrison at 135 pounds, is the best woman's bantamweight on the planet, which is amazing to say, honestly. I never thought that would see Harrison at 135. I thought she looked good. I think she can go out there and I think she can beat Pennington. So Harrison versus Pennington. I know you're talking about a 42-year-old Holly Holm. Who cares about Juliana Pena? I don't even know who else there is at Women's Bantamweight that's earned a title shot. Kayla Harrison has star power at Women's Bantamweight. There is nobody else aside from Pena who has star power at Women's Bantamweight. And if you want Pena to get a title shot... Just do Harrison versus Pena after Harrison versus Pennington. I think we just don't waste time doing this. Let's get Harrison active. She's 33 years old. Her prime is not going to last much longer, especially now that she has to cut down to 135. Harrison versus Pennington. Ideally, it gets made relatively soon. And for Holly Holm, it looked like Holly Holm was contemplating potential retirement, but I think I've got a pretty fun fight for her and a fight that she definitely will want back as it's another rematch rematches not everyone loves rematches but this is a good one trust me Jermaine Durandamy beat Holly Holm for the vacant woman's 145 pound title in somewhat controversial fashion as well in 2017 and Holly Holm has not got the opportunity to get that win back now Jermaine Durandamy come back after like almost four years away against Norma Dumont which was kind of random but interesting Holly Holm versus GDR, it's the fight that makes sense, it's a striker versus striker fight, it would be fun, but, 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 if the UFC, if, if, if you, if you make this an Apex main event, I will regret making that matchup, because I think it's a fantastic fight, but, it is not a main event, it's not a main event, you could put it on the prelims of a good pay-per-view, and you could probably, probably get away with putting it on the pay-per-view of a very terrible pay-per-view card, it's a good fight. Do not make it a main event. Oh my god. Anyway, Diego Lopez beats Sadiq Yusuf. Uh, Diego Lopez, in my opinion, is officially one of the most powerful guys at 145 pounds. Dominated Yusuf, man. And he's put Yusuf in a pretty bad spot because um, you'll see who I've got him matched up against next. And it's uh, it's, it's, rough. it's rough to be Sadiq Yusuf right now, I'll be honest with you. Um, <laughs> anyway, Diego Lopez. He, he called out Moza Efloev and let's just do it. Honestly, I, a lot of people, including myself, I thought that the fight to make was Ilya Tapuria versus Moza Evloev, undefeated versus undefeated. Scrap that. 
put that idea in the bin. I mean, I know I come up with that idea, but it was a hor horrible idea in hindsight. Max Holloway versus Ilya Tapuria is the fight to make. But another fight to make is the rematch of Movza Evloev versus Diego Lopez when Diego Lopez fought Movza Evloev on like a week's notice and gave Movza Evloev one of the toughest fights of his career. Evloev then went out there against Arnold Allen, won a controversial close decision. Let's do it. I think Lopez would beat Evloev in a rematch as well. Like I'm, I'm genuinely being serious when I say that as well. Like I, I, I genuinely think that Lopez would beat Lope, uh, Evloev. Lopez is looking so good right now, man. He's looking like, honestly, a guy that not many people in the world could beat. I think he can catch Evloev's bad striking. I, I like Lopez versus Evloev. I love this fight, man. This is a main card fight all day. Lopez is now a superstar as well, so you've got to capitalize on that. And give him a scary fight, because this is a scary fight. 18 and Omos or Evloev. I'm telling you right now, if Diego Lopez goes out there and knocks out and finishes 18-0 Movza Evloev on the main card of the big pay-per-view, like UFC 302, which is looking like it could be pretty big, UFC 303, the Conor McGregor card, if you do that, or even maybe in the Sofia, which is going to be the, uh, the UFC Mexico card, and Diego Lopez is Mexican and Brazilian, represents both. I genuinely think Lopez versus Evloev, UFC 302, ideally UFC 303, because Lopez could be an absolute mega star, man, with his fight style, his looks interesting and funny, which I think a lot of people love. Dude, I think Lopez could be a big star if he beats Evloev. And if Evloev beats Lopez, then you've got a 19-0 UFC title contender for your potentially undefeated champion. That's a massive fight. A massive fight, no matter what happens. For Sadiq Yusuf, if you actually look at Sadiq Yusuf, he's actually in a pretty bad spot right now. He's, what, 2-3 and three in his last 5? And the problem with Sadiq Yusuf is I don't think he's got any good wins that he can really stand on. So he can say, oh, hey, I've beaten this guy, so I should be ranked. You know, I should have my ranking. Sadiq Yusuf is going to have to defend his ranking because he's ranked, like, number 13 or 14 right now. And he might drop out of the rankings, potentially, because he just lost to Lopez. They're gonna, he's got no good wins to stand on. Alex Caceres, it's a decent win, but it's not that great. I think he's gonna have to go out there and defend his ranking against the, the guy who, in my opinion, is the most deserving of a ranked spot right now at 145 pounds that doesn't have one, Joanderson Brito. Joanderson Brito just beat jo jo Jonathan Pierce, who has been ranked at one point at 145 pounds. He kind of keeps jumping in and out, and Brito didn't get a ranked opponent. He beat Wilson, a short notice, in the bin. He beat Alexander, which is fine, but he beat Andre Philly, and Andre Philly's a top 25 guy right now as well. And I think he beats Jack Shaw. But if Jack Shaw wins, then do Jack Shaw versus Sadiq Yusuf. He could do that in the UK for Brito. If he beats Jack Shaw, which I do think he's going to in Brazil, then do Brito versus Sadiq Yusuf sometime later this year. Yusuf's not in a good spot right now. He's not going to get an easy fight. I was also thinking of Chepe Mariscal, but I was like... Beating Morgan Charrier by split decision is not enough to get a ranked opportunity. So, sorry, Chippy, I think you've got one more fight before you start getting in those conversations. But Renato Moicano beat Jalen Turner in a fight which Jalen Turner was going to win, but he threw away, which is a bit of a shame. And I really struggled to come up with ranking to, to, with fights for this one, especially with lightweight in general, because there's a lot of lightweights on this card. I struggled to find Gaethje an opponent, and I was thinking maybe it could have actually just been Renato, but... Renato wants money. This isn't a big money fight unless they do it in France and they tell Renato we'll give you a lot of money if you do it in France. And I know a lot of people are thinking, hey, what happened to Dan Hooker versus Benoit Saint-Denis? Dan Hooker has gone out there and said that he is going to be um, in the works to fight Benoit Saint-Denis, but he wants to fight before then. Renato wants money. He probably wants to fight before then too. So you could do Renato Moicano versus Dan Hooker, but I've got better matchups for them. Trust me. Benoit Saint-Denis versus Renato Moicano is what I was thinking of. For Jalen Turner, I've got another rematch. There's a lot of rematches that I've got on here, man. A rematch versus Matt Frivola. Matt Frivola beat Jalen Turner a long time ago. He's ranked number 15 right now. I know that Jalen Turner lost a split decision to Mateus Gamera, but he's actually on a little bit of a losing streak right now. He just lost to Renato Moicano after beating Bobby Green, but he lost to Dan Hooker. He lost to Gamera. I think a win over Matt Frivola would do things, good things for him because he's number 15 ranked right now. 
it's a loss that he's got on his record that he probably wants to get back. So that's a good fight. I think Frivola, he's got a bit of a fan base as well. It's a good fight. It's a big fight. It's a pay-per-view prelims type fight. Unfortunately for Jalen, I do think with the loss to Renato, I think he's going to have to probably get a couple more wins before he starts getting back on those UFC pay-per-view main card spots. But it also is potentially like a co-main event of a good fight night or something like that as well. It's a big fight. Jessica Andrade beat Marina Rodriguez. I thought she beat her pretty clearly, even though it was split. Andrade has fought everyone. There's literally no obvious fights for Andrade, and I don't think she deserves a title shot when Tatiana Suarez is right there. So this is going to sound random. But Amanda Rebus has got a pretty good run at women's shoreweight. I do know that she fought at flyweight against Rose Namajunas, which was kind of a weird sort of fight. But before that, she did beat Luana Pinheiro, and I'm pretty confident that fight was at women's strawweight. So she's holding a win. Her last win, or her last fight at women's strawweight, is a win over, I believe, the number nine ranked contender right now in the weight class. So she's got a good win that she can stand on. And she is the number 8 ranked fighter in the division. I know she's coming off a loss at 125 pounds. But Andrade is just in a weird spot where she's beaten everybody. But I don't think you can give her Zhang Wei Li. I think that you're going to have to give Zhang Wei Li Tatiana Suarez. So let's do Andrade versus Rebus. Kind of a weird fight, I know. Could be another Apex Fight Night main event, potentially. Could be on the pay-per-view of a bad uh, a bad pay-per-view the prelims of a pay-per-view or, or just uh, on a, in a crowded event uh, it's a good it's a good fight i think it'll be fun then you've got marina rodriguez she's on a slide right now a little bit of a losing streak she did beat michelle waterson gomez recently but i think that means absolutely nothing lupita godinez is coming off a loss but once again there's so many fights booked at women's straw weight right now that kind of um puts a lot of things out of, out, out of uh options Verona Jandaroba was someone I was thinking about, but Verona Jandaroba just beat Marina Rodriguez. He can't do that. And I was thinking of Tabitha Ricci, but Tabitha Ricci is actually going to be fighting against Raquel Pennington's wife, who is... Slipped my name, Atisha Torres. But, um, yeah, so uh, she's already been booked. So it's got to be Marina Rodriguez versus Lupita Godinez, is what I've done there. This is the banger that I come up with, Bobby Green versus Dan Hooker. I think this fight is too good to miss out on. It has been previously booked, and then I think something happened. I think Dan Hooker actually pulled out of that fight, which was a little bit unfortunate, but this is a fight that's too good to miss, because I think that Bobby Green... Bobby Green does seem like a guy that's just going to go forever, but he's not getting younger. He's like 38 years old himself. He's going to probably retire within the next few years, and Dan Hooker is chasing the belt. Dan Hooker's a guy that just keeps chasing the belt. That's why he's lost so many fights, is because he just takes on really hard matchups. He fought Poirier in an effort to chase the belt. He did the UMC a favor and took on Michael Chandler in his debut, beat Huck Prast, and then he took on Makachev on short notice, lost, took on Arnold Allen at 145 pounds, and then lost there in a pursuit of the 145 pound title. He's got a pretty good league to stand on with a win over Jalen Turner, in my opinion, and a dominant win over Puelles, but I think that Dan Hooker can go out there, fight Bobby Green. I think he would beat Bobby Green as well. I would pick Dan Hooker in that matchup, and then we can start talking about Benoit Saint-Denis kind of matchups, or Benil Dariush kind of matchups. I mean, honestly, I might even pick Dan Hooker to beat Benil Dariush at this point. But um, yeah, maybe Dan Hooker versus Benil, but I'm thinking Bobby Green versus Dan Hooker. That fight is too good to miss. Do it at UFC 302 as well, because Dan Hooker would make the press conference interesting with Bobby Green, because they'll yap. But more importantly, Dan Hooker and Dustin Poirier aren't that friendly at all. So even if Dustin Poirier gets absolutely smoked by Islam Akachev, they might do Poirier versus Hooker in a rematch. So that could set up a lot of good things for Hooker if he plays his cards right. Bobby Green versus Dan Hooker, UFC 302. For Jim Miller, he got absolutely smoked by Bobby Green. There's no really easy way to say. 30-25 for scorecards. He doesn't want to retire. He wants to keep going. Uh, at this point with Jim Miller, let's not give him contenders. I know Bobby Green is 38 years old, but he still was ranked number 14. Michael Johnson. Let's go, Michael Johnson. And Jim Miller have never fought the fourth. That was the fight. I feel like it was to make it UFC 300. And if you're not going to do it UFC 300, do it maybe on the prelims of UFC 303. That's in 10 weeks, though. That might be way too soon for Jim Miller to come back from that beating. So... Maybe we're talking about like UFC 304, UFC 305 kind of time. Michael Johnson versus Jim Miller. People love Jim Miller. Don't put Jim Miller versus Michael Johnson on in the Apex. Just at least put it in a crowded 
arena, even if it is at the Sofia, which I know is the UFC Mexico card. I know, and I know that Miller and uh, Johnson aren't Mexican, but just a card that's guaranteed to have a crowd that will appreciate Jim Miller at least. Miller's not going to be around for much longer. Miller versus Johnson, that's the fight to make. I like that one a lot. For Figueredo, honestly, once again, it's kind of just difficult because I'm pretty sure Yarn and Song Yedong are both injured. Am I correct in saying that? Pyotr Yarn apparently just had surgery on his leg. And Song Yedong, I think, also got injured in that fight. So we're both Yarn and Yedong injured, and that kind of leaves only a few people. Henry Cejudo, which is a fight that I think makes sense. Or Marlon Vera, which is the fight that I went with, because he just lost to Sean O'Malley, and once again, kind of similar to Aljamain Sterling, Davis and Figueredo is a former champion at 125 pounds. I know he's coming up to 135 off a loss, but he just beat another former champion in Cody Garbrandt. Before that, he beat Rob Font. I think Marlon Vera is a logical step up in competition, and that would be a fun fight, and maybe a fight that you could put on in the Sofia. I know that uh, Marlon Vera is Ecuadorian and not Mexican, so... Maybe not. Maybe you just do it at like UFC 304 or wherever. Something going on like that. Maybe some sort of crowded event. You can't do Vera versus Figgy. That's the problem with the UFC these days, man. It's either Apex cards or massive cards. It's just, it's just so silly. But anyway, Vera versus Figgy, not in the Apex, in front of a crowd at some point. Main card of the pay-per-view, I would say this is probably worthy of doing. Let's do it. And for crew for Garbrandt, Garbrandt didn't take much damage, and I feel like he's going to be somewhat ready to come back sometime soon, because it didn't look like he took too much damage in the matchup, although he did get choked out, of course. UFC 303. Main card. Cody Garbrandt. Another rematch. Man, I've done so many rematches. Versus Dominic Cruz. This was the fight to do for UFC 300. Cruz versus Garbrandt in the rematch. Once again, it's another ranked opponent for Cody Garbrandt. Cruz hasn't fought since 2022. He seems to still be active and still fighting, so let's just do it. Cruz versus Garbrandt. That'll be a that'll be a that'll be a really good fight, man. Like Cruz versus Garbrandt too. On the main card, let them yap in the press conference. I think they'd sell the fight. I think they'll sell the fight big time. You know, Cruz is probably really wanting to get a win back over Cody Garbrandt, you know, so let's just do it, Cruz versus Garbrandt too, that's what I've done for UFC 300, let me know what you think in the comments below, and I'll see you guys in the next one.